You're listening to the Eyes on Washington podcast, Holland and Knight's overarching public policy and regulation podcast series. Our public policy and regulation group has an ideal combination of lawyers and lobbyists with a comprehensive understanding of the federal policy and regulatory process. This series will shine a light on the shifting dynamics of governmental entities and the ensuing changes in economic or political policies, laws, and regulations that can have a critical impact on the health and future of your business. Hello, I'm Dan Senek co lead for the Defense and National Security team here at Holland and Knight. This is one in a series of podcasts in which we break down the fiscal year 2024 National Defense Authorization Act. Over the next several podcasts, I'll be joined by partners from throughout the firm that specialize in many different areas of law and policy that the NDAA covers. This week, we will focus on general themes in the FY24 NDAA related to emerging technology and what we see in this year's NDAA that signals where DOD will be making substantial investments in the coming years. I'm joined today by two of my esteemed colleagues here at the firm. First, Paul Steimers, member of the Public Policy and Regulatory Group, and David Cole, a partner with the Holland and Knight Corporate and Securities Group. Paul, why don't you give listeners a little bit of an overview of your background? Thanks, Dan. Uh, I've been uh, lobbying on emerging and disruptive technology matters before Congress and the administration for about 20 years. Much of that time focused on commercial space flight. I also am the uh, founder and executive director of the Quantum Industry Coalition, the voice of the U.S. quantum industry before Congress and the administration. And I've done a fair amount of work on AI and internet politics as well. Thanks, Paul. And uh, David Cole, can you give us a little bit of thumbnail sketch of what you do here at the firm and your background? Sure. Thank you so much, Dan. Again, my name is David Cole. I'm a partner at Holland and Knight in our corporate and securities group. My practice involves mergers and acquisitions and finance. Uh, The finance side of my practice involves early stage financing all the way through to mature stage financing, including uh, debt both commercial loans as well as public offerings of uh, bonds and notes. And I'm a federal securities lawyer, so I help companies with respect to capital markets transactions, including IPOs, other registered offerings of securities, tender offers, take private transactions, you name it. So it's a, it's a corporate practice focused on M&A and finance. Thanks so much. Let me start off with Paul. Paul, can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the the NDAA, thousands of pages, emerging technology is kind of what we've advertised in our discussion for today, which is a rather broad area. Can you break down for us kind of the top three areas in emerging technology that kind of stood out for you in the FY24 NDAA? For me, there were a couple of themes that ran through. Number one, we're trying to learn lessons from current conflicts about what the future of war is going to look like. And based on what we're seeing in Ukraine, for example, the future of war is going to look a lot more like unmanned vehicles, drones for targeting support, intelligence for munitions delivery, things like that. So the NDAA has a lot of provisions related to and and funding authorization related to unmanned vehicles, both aerial and on the surface and undersea. The second thing I'd say is that there's efforts related to modernization of some of the back end of the Defense Department, the the tail, if you will. And that looks like procurement and logistics efforts. And then the third thing is that we're seeing some investments in advanced and emerging technologies. And and in particular, we're looking at things like quantum computing and quantum technologies, assured positioning, navigation, and timing, things like that. So those three areas, I think, are what stood out to me in this bill. Great. And could we do a little bit more of a deep dive on unmanned systems? There are kind of two different components, I think, that are focused on in the in this year's NDAA. There is the the acquisition of emerging technologies related to unmanned systems, but then there's also how are we managing proliferation of Chinese unmanned systems as well? Anything stand out there? that our listeners need to know about regarding acquisition of Chinese or foreign technology? Well, the uh, NDAA thinks you should not do that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's 
a little sterner than that, as it turns out, there are provisions limiting specifically the acquisition of, of Chinese-made drones. There's also provisions limiting Chinese logistical support software as well. Those were among the two big call-outs in the NDAA. There are opportunities for companies to sell into the unmanned aerial vehicle space. There's also a lot in the NDAA for counter unmanned aerial vehicle activity. So base defense and things like that, whether that's watching for incoming drones or countering them with munitions and so forth, that's a big part of the NDAA. And part of what we're seeing both in the NDAA and, and the Associated Defense Appropriations Bill is a desire to be able to acquire large numbers of relatively inexpensive drones that can be deployed, coordinated, and expended as needed in an upcoming conflict. And so that is similar to the DOD replicator program that was announced? That is, that is what the replicator program is designed to do is, in the drone context and others, is to be able to field large numbers of relatively inexpensive, relatively painless to lose <laughs> vehicles, unmanned systems that can be used in a future conflict. And do you see that as one of those lessons learned from Ukraine? Absolutely. I think we're moving away from large, highly capable, but very vulnerable targets in all ways. We've seen this on the battlefield in Ukraine as very small drones have been able to disable tanks. We're seeing that in space. It's been the case for several years now that the Space Force has wanted to move away from large, juicy targets that could be easily attacked and that would take a long time to reconstitute. We're seeing that at sea, where we're really starting to re-examine the capital ship model and the, and the carrier model, especially in light of vulnerability to things like hypersonic weapons. Right. And I, I want to come back to you to talk a little bit more about quantum and PNT, but let me transition real quick to David. David, what are your top three insights that you used? One of the things we were talking about before the, the podcast started is the NDAA and the appropriations bills are really good indications of where both the Department of Defense and, and Congress want to make future investments. And that can be really informative to companies that are looking to invest in those areas or produce in those areas. Is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely right, Dan. So at Holland and Knight, we're very fortunate to get to work side by side with a number of contractors, both in the aerospace and defense industry, as well as in the services sector. And one of the things that we typically do year over year over year is take a look at the NDAA for signals. And it's important to pick up on these signals if you're a government contractor, because it, it, they help you to figure out where you should spend your time and your energy and your efforts on um, human capital, acquisition and on bidding and um, procurement opportunities. And looking at the NDAA uh, this year, I think that government contractors should look at a few things. Number one is the fact that the DOD is also going to play a role in uh, the intelligence community and intelligence gathering as well from space. The intelligence community has for many years relied on space-based assets for intelligence gathering. And the NDAA makes it clear that the Air Force is going to also play uh, an important role in intelligence gathering from space. Uh, the other things that I think that government contractors can pick up on is that the, the United States is going to, again, continue to commit to um, creating some sort of launch capability whether it's government launch capabilities or commercial launch capabilities. And, and the NDAA has opportunities for launch companies replete through it. And then finally, I think there's going to be a continued emphasis on communications. And that's communications between satellites and ground operations, whether in country or on the battlefield. And a number of government contractors will find opportunities in the NDAA to use artificial intelligence and other newly developing technologies uh, to help them complete their missions for all of the services under the DOT. Do you think that this year's NDAA has addressed 
many of the challenges or at least some of the challenges that um, companies and contractors that are working for the Department of Defense are facing related to foreign competition. Do you think that the NDAA, any particular provisions that you would call out that kind of help companies in that space? As Paul was saying earlier, there certainly are strong warnings not to use Chinese-based technologies, certainly when it comes to drones, but also with respect to communications uh, technologies. That's really nothing new. I mean, that's been going on for years, but uh, there will be opportunities for U.S. firms to uh, redouble their efforts in communications because, frankly, the government has been focused for quite some time on developing uh, U.S.-based uh, communications technologies. What are you telling your clients today about the uncertainty with regard to appropriations? We, the NDAA, we know, passed every year for the last 63 years. The appropriations process is a little bit less certain. How are you advising your clients that are looking to invest in the sector? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Dan. I mean, the one thing that many of our GovCon clients take solace in is the fact that we annually, uh, for quite some time now, have passed Defense Authorization Act legislation significantly before we have a budget. And just this week, it was announced again that we'll have yet another continuing resolution. So as our friends on Capitol Hill continue to discuss somewhat animately, the budget for FY24, government contracting community, especially those that are focused on the DOD, have a much more clear um, insight into what's going to be available for them from an appropriations perspective. And I know you do a lot of work, David, and Paul definitely does as well, with space uh, companies and the, the space yes. economy. Anything that really jumped out at you in the NEAA you mentioned launch capabilities as an example, and also intel gathering from space. Any policy changes that you saw or anything that jumped out at you that may make it easier to do business with the federal government in this area? So I'll let Paul sort of talk more about the policy angle, because from my perspective, I think it's a sort of a continuation of U.S. policy to ensure that we have sufficient domestic capabilities to launch and to um, operate and maintain communications with, through assets that are based in space. So I'm not sure that there's a change in policy, but I, I would let Paul comment on that. I think from a business uh, and government contracting commercial perspective, I think it's clear that those contractors who are focused on intelligence gathering have new opportunities, not just working with three-letter agencies, but now working also with a number of services within the DOD and programs within uh, the DOD for intelligence gathering opportunities. And, and the tools that will be used for that intelligence gathering will be space-based tools, including communications tools and artificial intelligence tools to help those contractors sift through masses and masses and masses of data in order to be able to find those needles in the haystack that allow uh, companies to provide actionable intelligence to their government customers. That's great. And that's a great segue to Paul. Um, Paul, why don't you tell us a little bit about your observations regarding some of the space-related provisions in this year's NDAA? I think you were absolutely right. This is a continuation of prior policy there. It's vitally important to the United States from a national securities perspective to have assured access to space. It's vitally important to the United States to have assured positioning, navigation, and timing, to have assured intelligence gathering and, and dissemination capabilities. And so the NDAA really strives to make that happen and, and, and continue what's been a priority for several years in that regard. We are seeing the continued standing up of the Space Force and Space Command, and Space Development Agency and all of that. And there is a fair amount within the NDAA that focuses on how all of that is supposed to work and the commercial contracts that are involved there and, and also on integrating space operations with allies and partners to make sure that we're working hand in glove with our allies across the globe. 
the primary focus of treating space as a warfighting domain, treating space as a contested and congested environment, which is an increasingly different way of viewing space than, than we previously have had. Previously, we could put exquisite, expensive platforms up in space and trust that they wouldn't be damaged or destroyed or, or uh, otherwise interfered with. That is no longer the case at all. And so our focus is, is turning to resilience, turning to rapid reconstitution, and turning to uh, proliferation so that we deter attack in space. Oh, that's great. Because we're starting to run out of time. I want to give just a couple minutes uh, your thoughts on quantum provisions in the NDA, but then overall environment and the leveraging of, of quantum computing within the Department of Defense. So the Defense Department sees a variety of quantum technologies as important in the next few years. Nearest term is clocks and sensors for use in positioning, navigation, and timing. If GPS is taken out, we need to be able to have our various military platforms know where they are and know when they are and be able to work with each other and report back up the chain of command. So that's something that is of extremely near-term interest to the Defense Department. The Department views quantum computing as also very important, but somewhat further out. And the NDAA reflects that. There's funding and authorization within the NDAA to do some research in quantum computing and a little bit of deployment, but it's still what I would classify as early stage. And the Quantum Industry Coalition did some work on that with the uh, Armed Services Committees. The other thing I'd, I'd point to just briefly is AI. And there, the NDAA really is looking at how the department should engage with AI and how it should limit the potential risks of AI, whether it's misinformation or the insertion of malicious code or, or things like that. In both cases, I think the department is taking a forward-leaning but cautious approach, and I think we'll see more of that in the upcoming NDAA and, and in years to come. That's a great summary. I appreciate it. And David, as we are wrapping up, last-minute thoughts on what you see based on the FY24 NDA, what you see in the coming year from a business perspective for defense clients? Thanks, Dan. I think that the NDAA reflects the world is a dangerous place and our world continues to expand. And as Paul has emphasized, we have to protect ourselves and our assets, not only here on earth, but now in space. And that's going to create all new opportunities for airspace and defense companies, service providers, and other government contractors to advance the mission of being able to protect the homeland and protect our assets um, throughout the world and in space. And this year's NDAA is merely a beginning for that. And I think that companies that invest in technologies and human capital and in business development opportunities in these areas will will reap the rewards of their investment uh, now and in, into the future. Well said, David. And Paul, any parting thoughts on what you'll be telling your clients regarding defense priorities in emerging technology? I certainly agree with David. And I would say that already we're seeing that the next NDAA, the FY25 NDAA process is underway in Congress. And so for any company that thinks it may have something to contribute along these priority lines, the time is certainly now to start participating in that process to make Congress aware and to make the Defense Department aware of, of these capabilities and to start working to influence that, that next year's bill. Great. Thank you, Paul. Paul Steimers and David Cole, thank you so much for the conversation. Uh, really appreciate it. And this was a, a really great conversation. We will be back next time with another aspect of the National Defense Authorization Act. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the Eyes on Washington podcast, brought to you by Holland and Knight's Public Policy and Regulation Group. For more information on our public policy and regulation group, please visit hklaw.com slash PPR.